and welcome to another edition and a special edition of Pitching In. I'm Jason Mackey alongside Michael McHenry, and you probably recognize the beautiful face along with us live from Baltimore, Maryland, the one and only Matt Caps. Capper, welcome, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I was telling Ford earlier, I got into Baltimore early today and took a little nap, which uh, with young kids never happens in my real life, but uh, was kind <laughs> of fun. Yeah, it was, was kind of fun. Took a little nap and then went and had dinner and now just hanging out. Looking forward to chatting with you guys. Boring dinner, right? Like some Chick-fil-A or... Yeah, yeah. I want to hear Blanc. about that dinner one more time. You know what? I'll go ahead and throw it out there. The place is called Sabatino's in Little Italy uh, here in downtown Baltimore, and it was unbelievable. It was incredible. Uh, so I ordered the veal salt and boca, and my waitress, who had been working there for 45 years, she told me, uh, just flat out said, no, you don't want the veal salt and boca. And then she rattled off something else that I wanted. And I said, yeah, yeah I think you're right. I have no idea what she said it was. I know it was veal, but how it was prepared, I have no clue. But it was unbelievable. So good. I love it, man. I can't wait. I get down there tomorrow. Um, I'm in Pittsburgh in my dining room. But uh, Baltimore, I'm a, I'm a big fan, guys. I don't know what you think, but uh, big fan of Camden Yards, big fan of the city. I know that like, from Pittsburgh, I'm supposed to hate them, but I've covered a lot of Ravens games. They're always really good to us. I was at the Orioles series last year. You guys, have you, you played in Baltimore both, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Is it, is, it, is it equally the same to play there as it is to, I don't know, cover a game, watch a game there? Like, do you guys enjoy it just as much? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll answer that. Yeah, I do. I mean, um, I kind of think about stadiums and cities. This is going to come as no surprise to you two gentlemen, but uh, <laughs> by, by the food that I get to enjoy when I'm, when I'm in, and, in and around it. And I, I love seafood. Uh, yeah. I love crabs. Uh, actually, when I was pitching for the Nationals, my wife and I were, were watching, um, it was a Food Network show, and O'Bricks came on and we actually on an off day drove up from DC and went to O'Bricks just to have some crabs. And, um, you know, I enjoy it. I remember, uh, when I was with the twins, uh, Jim Tomey brought in a bunch of crabs. I mean, I don't know how many pounds of crabs that we had in the clubhouse after the game and Boy. just sitting, sitting around in the clubhouse, uh, breaking crabs apart and having dinner and some beers and whatnot in the clubhouse. It, it was really cool, but you know, when you get to the ballpark, once you get on the field, all the bases are 90 feet, all the mounds are 60 feet, 6 inches. There's the other cool things about the stadiums. And, you know, the really cool thing about uh, the Orioles ballpark here is the Camden Yards and the, the uh-huh. brick and kind of the facade. And, um, you know, I grew up, uh, I, I guess, was a, a, a teenager, young teenager, uh, young boy in the mid-90s with – Cal Ripken Jr. in the streak. I remember sitting on my bed in my my room when Cal Ripken broke uh, mm. broke the record, watching that, and then to get to pitch in a ballpark like that. And it was kind of the first of the new modern ballparks. So uh, it was cool for me to come here. I grew up with Nick Markakis, uh, so seeing him out in the outfield when I'd walk out to the bullpens, running by him all day. Grinder, by the way. Oh, oh, stud. Hmm. Yep, stud. So I, I, I too, Mac, always enjoyed yeah. coming to Baltimore. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned the Ripken thing too. I can, as soon as you said that, I'm like, I, I put myself where I was sitting watching that. Like, it's just such an iconic moment, but we're yeah. all pretty close in age, right? Like, yeah, I'm 39. Yeah. I think 38. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, yeah. who's older? Who's older, Mackie? You or me? When I do you turn you 40? I think you are. When do you turn 40? November 7th. Oh, yeah. So you guys got to call me sir the rest of this uh, podcast. <laughs> All right, sir. Hey, the, 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 the one story I have, I, I echo your elders, Ford. Respect exactly. your elders. Exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Caps. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, one, the one cool story I have, um, I didn't play there much, but the first time I went there, Potash took me to um, Fort McHenry, and I got to raise the yeah. flag. So outside of the, outside of the same thing you guys were talking about, I was a huge Cal Ripken fan. You know, walking in, seeing the brick and the tradition. And Cappy, I, I'm going to be honest. When I was there, they had some of the best spread. I felt like the AL East had some of the best spread. I mean, they just did it right. I got a ribeye one day. We had Capitol Grill one day. I mean, it's just one of those places that they do it right. I think because all the money that comes in from the big market teams. But yeah, that, that was special. I think we're even showing a like little glimpse back to 2012 when when Potash did that. I thought that was really neat. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. I saw that coming over the bridge um, when I flew in, got in the Uber and to the uh, to the hotel here. I saw the big sign for Fort McHenry. Thought about you. Uh, if I was a real good friend, I would have texted you. But you know, I was. I don't know what I was doing. Not paying attention. I kind of felt a, a little like tingle that you're thinking. I'm going to about it. <laughs> that's that's, that's right. Good. About it. Yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> All right, Good. let's talk a little ball, guys. Let's talk a little ball. We can talk some Baltimore plenty. We can talk some road stuff. But I think this is a pretty important series for the Pirates and not an easy series. I think you probably both agree with me. The Orioles coming off a series win over the Rays. Um, off to just a, a ridiculous start, probably not talked about enough. Pirates have lost 9 of 10. Um, we can sit here and pick apart what's been wrong. Um, but as far as realistic stuff, guys, I mean, probably not all of it's going to shift in one game. But, you know, if you could pick one thing that you'd sort of like to, I don't know, turn back time or make work again, Ford, I'll start with you. What do you, what would you most like to see this team improve on quickly? Sliding. So no Cruz is back in the lineup. <laughs> I didn't um, think of a time machine. I meant for Friday. What do you, yeah. Um, I agree with you. That would be huge, man. I would say confidence. Uh, the, the confidence, it's the first time, you know, I have the view in Cappy, you know, this. Or maybe, actually, you're going to be surprised because you haven't been at at t yet this year. I got the uh, conference room set up very nice. I have all 20 camera views. So I can see these guys, you know, with the hanging of the head, the, the deep breathing, the, the throwing of the stuff. And you can see that they're kind of losing that, that swagger and that confidence. And that's what I hope they bring back because this Orioles team is super confident. They're really, really playing well as a unit. They're kind of average all the way through when you look at all their numbers. But, man, they are a great team, and I felt like that's what we were doing. We've just lost a little bit of sight of that. I think Kutch having a big day, making some really good adjustments, is going to kind of boost everybody's morale going into Baltimore. But the day off couldn't have come any any better than today. Yeah, I agree with you on the day off after a snide, like uh, you know, losing nine of the last ten. Um, you know, a chance to just kind of breathe and to breathe at home. You know, there's there's a difference for me, a day off on the road or a day off at home. You know, you can get in your car, you can go for a drive, you can kind of do what you want. Days off on the road, you're kind of uh, shoehorned into what's around the hotel or, you know, if you have your golf clubs with you or, or friends on the other team or whatever it is. Uh, but you don't have the options like you do at home. So, a day off at home and not flying until later. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity for these guys to, to breathe. So um, confidence is a big thing. That's a great answer there for it. Uh, for me, it, it will always start and end with starting pitching. Mm. Uh, you, you look at, at the great start that this Pirates ball club had in April in the first week of May um, <clears throat> or coming into the first week of May. Uh, starting pitching was really, really good. And I, I can't remember the numbers, but it was what, like 22 or 23 quality starts, uh, something like that. And, you know, other than the Mitch Keller perfect game the other night, um, you know, our, we need our starters to go out and compete, go deep into ball games. And, you know, my biggest fear, and I'm, and I'm a little bit biased because it's what I did. Um, what we saw last year is this bullpen was so good so early and then they were overstretched and used in so many rough spots and so many times that it kind of fell apart and unraveled in August and September. Um, bullpen guys are trained to throw one inning and you stretch them out for two innings from time to time. But when that consistently has to happen, um, you're going to beat up guys. Uh, guys are going to get hurt. Their stuff's going to uh, diminish. Uh, they're pitching tired. Um, the, the reliever is just not designed to eat up that many innings. So uh, we need our starters to go deep, and we need our starters to to give us an opportunity to compete um, <clears throat> later in ball games. Um, and we we got to score some runs. I mean, you know, do I expect us to score seven, eight runs every night? No. But um, if we can go out, score three or four, and and be in games come the fifth or sixth inning. Uh, or sixth or seventh inning, I should say. I really like our odds of stacking up uh, mm -hmm. under Underwood, uh, Holderman, and Bednar against anybody. Yeah, Mackie, you are teed up, and I, I know where up. you're going. I know where you're going. Where here you go. Going? Where, where right here, tee it up. We where can't run going? into outs. Can't run into outs. Come on, tee it up. It's, it's I actually perfect. wasn't. I actually wasn't going with the base running. What? I, w I wasn't going with the base running. No. I mean, I would like to see that change, but I think there's something more important that you guys haven't mentioned yet. 
And I That's understand good. why. Hitting with runners in scoring position. Amen. Getting some sort of key hit. It has evaporated. Um, I, w- I did a piece today. It's an analysis, a big, like, numbers-heavy thing. Um, did some research. But uh, these numbers blew my mind, man. The first 28 games where the Pirates were going well, they hit 312 with runners in scoring position. Great. I'll take that all year. Yeah. Past 10, where they've lost nine, they've hit 133. Um, if I can change one thing, it's that. And I think that's what Derek Shelton was alluding to. He said it a couple times in the home state about, you know, we need a key hit. We need to hit the break it open. We just need something to get some confidence. And I think that's it because I think it's it's one big umbrella, right, with that stuff, at least the way I see it. Some of the outs on the bases, how they're pushing the issue. They're feeling like they're having to do so much more than they actually have to do because they're not scoring. They're trying to create stuff that sometimes isn't there. And if you actually get some hits with runners in scoring position, which they were getting early on, I think that takes care of itself. So, yeah, I don't want to see guys make outs on the bases, and I think they've been a little too reckless with that stuff, but it would be alleviated, in my opinion, with some hits with runners in scoring position. I also won't disagree with you, Kathy. I think that's uh, starting pitching equally as important. Well, and, and and those are both great points right there. Sorry to cut you off for it, but the base the base running was so good, and we talked so much about that during the early parts when, when the record was spectacular of how they're being aggressive. Um, maybe being a little bit reckless at times, uh, and, and that's catching up to us here the last couple of weeks. Uh, but but you're hitting the nail on the head with, with runners in scoring position. And we talked about that a little bit on the broadcast during the Tampa series when I was working. Um, <clears throat> hitting 312 for a season with runners in scoring position is highly unlikely. <laughs> uh, but, but, if, but if we can be somewhere in the middle – you know, give give me even 240, 250, yeah. uh, you know, and, and we've got a chance there. So uh, it's just playing the game. It's playing the game the right way. Runner on second base makes with less than, with no outs, you've got to get him to third base. Runner at third base with less than two outs, you've got to find a way to score him. Infield in, you got to try and hit the ball on the ground. Uh, or infield back, you got to try and hit the ball on the ground. Infield in, you got to somehow find a way to get underneath the baseball. And, and it's just, you know, playing good baseball. We've got to get back to that. So I want to ask both of you guys, and this is a hitting and pitching type question. Justin Morneau, one of your former teammates, Cappy, um, said something I thought was brilliant. It's like, no matter what, just think about one guy, one guy getting him in when you have runners in score position. And I love that mentality for a bullpen guy as well. But I especially love it for a starter. And I think too often those guys, especially when we're not pitching as well as they want to, instead of just finding a way to the guy right in front of them, they're thinking down the line too too far sometimes, especially like Oviedo and and Contreras trying to force the issue instead of like, hey, what's right in front of me and how can I get this out? We watched Chris Bassett. I think he walked four, maybe even five. He's done that over his last couple starts, but he's not giving up runs. He's picking and choosing his battles. It's like he's playing chess and the other teams are playing checkers. And I feel like we can do that with the guy's stuff that we have, but we, we're not focused on that one pitch, one at bat at a time, and then just getting in that one guy like you were just talking about is like move them over, bunt, accept where you're at, and, and move forward. I want to hear if you guys have heard any, you know, really cool thoughts on that. I thought Morneau's thought was brilliant. It really helped my career to simplify it, but I wanted to hear y'all's expertise. Yeah, I can jump hey. on that. Go ahead. Take it away. I can take it away. Um, I see a, a brand of that for it. Um, you know, sort of simplifying and, and finishing the job, if that makes sense. And, and the person I would use for an example of that would be Rowanzi Contreras, where you see the ability there. Like he has the stuff to put guys away. He knows what he's doing. Um, and I watch him pitch go 0-2, 1-2. Um, and, and maybe it's like focusing on the task at hand, not thinking too far ahead. And just also not feeling like the job is done or, or realizing the importance of that final strike. Um, and I don't, I, it's it's tough to place because obviously, right? Like he's he's not unaware that that's the hardest strike to get. But making better pitches in those key situations. Um, if you yeah, look that, at that's the, been a struggle. It, Absolutely, yeah, that's a big it, struggle. It has, and with Oviedo, like it to me, it's you know trusting his fastball a little bit more. Um, you know, varying varying things, having confidence in that. And I, I don't know if that's like focusing on the the minute or the the, the micro versus the macro, but I certainly see, like, with each guy, little things they can sort of drill down on. 
I don't know, Caps, what do you, what do you it, think about that? Cappy, before <laughs> you take this away, I'm going to tee you up for this. Down and away, both of those guys. I don't understand why they're not dominating down and away. Both of them, when they came up, that was their best fastball. And their miss was up and in, like we've talked about, I don't know how many times. Take it away. I know you love that. So, Yeah, I mean, the down and away fastball should be a, a pitcher's free throw. It, it should. I should be able to stand on the mound and execute a down and away fastball with my eyes closed, just like a basketball player needs to be able to hit a free throw with their eyes closed. Um, it's the most repetitive pitch that we ever throw. Every time I play catch, warming up, and I talk to my kids about this uh, when we're out there, the the glove side hip uh, of your throwing partner. You know, you need to try and execute and learn to repeat that down and away fastball because everything comes off of it the slider away, the change up away. Uh, and then when you can learn to execute that to your glove side down and away fastball, elevating is easy. It's super easy. All I got to do is keep my hands together a little bit longer and then I'm timed up to where I'm up in the zone. Uh, for me, arm side was super easy. I don't know if it was that way for everybody. Um, but everything, all my feel, command, everything came off the down and away fastball. If I, if I could command that pitch – he had no shot because if I could command that, I could command everything else uh, and everything else was working. Um, Mackie, going to Oviedo's fastball, I, I think you're absolutely right. His confidence with his fastball, and, and it kind of feeds into Fort's point of, of commanding the down and away fastball. Um, I understand the mindset of throwing our best pitch uh, mm -hmm. the most. <clears throat> Completely understand that. Um but but when you got ninety seven in the tank, you can't throw you can't throw it out the window. Right. That's a good pitch. That's a good pitch. What it, uh, it, Matt, doesn't it? It makes the slider that much more effective. That's you know, that's a hitter, that's and a, I don't know which one I'm getting. I'm pretty much screwed with both. And that that's that's kind of the problem with saber metrics. I I love all the numbers and the data and everything that it shows us. But they're human beings out there, and we can't ever as pitchers we can't ever forget that hitting is hard. And hitting is all about timing. Any hitter that can hit, they'll tell you it's all about being timed up. Uh, and if I'm timed up for the fastball, I know I have to keep my hands back for the breaking ball. Um, if I can go up there as a hitter, and Fort can speak on this better than he can because I didn't hit past high school, but um, if I can go up there and I can eliminate a fastball and all I have to do is sit soft, I've got a chance on anything in the zone, anything in the zone. So if I go up as a, hit, as a hitter and I know that this guy can't command his fastball, I'm just looking soft in the zone. Now I'm looking up. So not only am I looking up and I'm looking for pitches off speed stuff up, those aren't just singles up the middle. <laughs> those are doubles in the gaps and balls that leave the ballpark. So those are damage type situations that the guys get themselves into. Um, <clears throat> to your point, Jason, if I've got 97 in the tank, and a guy has to respect it, and they got to gear up for it. Now I'm getting away with that breaking ball that maybe is a mistake in the zone. Now I'm not saying every time, uh, but but I'm going to get away with it because the guy's geared up for the fastball, and it's it's hard when you're trying to do damage, get the foot down, get the barrel of the bat out in front to meet 95, 97 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> it's hard to stay back and and hit that spinner in the middle of the plate. And I'm going to use two examples for both of you guys. A.J. Burnett and J.T. Brubaker, both guys, when they established down and away, it changed, kind of changed the trajectory of their career. I know Brubaker got hurt, but Brubaker, Brubaker throwing that sinker constantly down and away made his slider better. And you, yeah. you guys correct me. I mean, that's going to get you more extension, and it's going to allow you to really feel that pitch and allow you to miss right off of it. So my problem with Oviedo and Contreras is they're trying to go up so much – Oviedo is trying to go up and in and up and away to righties, um, excuse me, up and away to lefties. And the problem is, is he never gets that extension. He never establishes. So everything's back and he's hanging that breaking ball, hanging that slider. I thought Contreras did a good job last start. He only threw four pitches down in the zone, which I still think would be remarkable for him. But yeah, I think that just establishes something with all your mechanics, especially a guy like Oviedo who's had trouble with his fastball. I think it really play with all of his pitches and then his misses go diagonal, which win, yeah. right? Like A.J. Burnett yeah. did not throw arm side ever, right? Mm -hmm. It missed that way, though. Kevin Correa didn't throw arm side ever, but it would miss that way. You guys don't know any better. Like, Captain, yeah. you had really good command. 
Mackie, you're throwing all the split nasties. But the, no, the reality, don't, don't love me in this discussion. Yeah, no, just but the reality Wait. of it is, is like you can play guys as miss because as a hitter, you don't know. Yeah, and that's well, what it, I think they need to do a better job of. And it does and a I, couple of it, it does a couple of things for you. For when I've got extension and I'm out front, my stuff plays better. I'm on the baseball longer. The spin is tighter. Uh, usually, I throw harder uh, without having to try to throw harder. Um, it also, you're going to open up the door to more chases. So if, if a guy's not commanding his fastball down and away, now they're looking middle of the plate. So anything that's not middle of the plate, if, it, if it's starting out of, the, out of the pitcher's hand, outer edge and down, they're taken because they know that it's breaking off and it's going to be a ball. And it might only be a ball by a baseball or two, uh, but if they have to stay on, especially like guys like AJ Burnett and uh, and JT Brubaker that that can really get that that sink, um, yeah, they got to pick a side. Like, all right, is this gonna is this gonna run back to the plate, middle part of the plate, or is it gonna run off? And that's why you see guys that can command that fastball like that. You see so many swing and misses on breaking balls that are way out of the zone because the hitter has to honor that down and away that it could be a fastball and it's gonna stay through the strike zone. They got to stay on it. The only point I'll add to this, this is an interesting discussion to it. it. I remember in spring training, it was, I think after Oviedo's last start, maybe his next to last start, I kind of pulled him aside and was talking to him about what makes his slider so effective. And I found it strange that he started talking about his fastball and the extension and getting mm. out front. And now that ties together with what you guys are saying that that's why it's so effective for him. And I think that's why it hasn't been as effective for him these past two starts. And going back to Cappy's point, what you just said, Mackie, is the kids lacked confidence in his fastball because this, the matrix of it aren't as good as they could be. You see 97 with great extension. You want high spin so it could be, you know, a guy that gets a lot of swing and miss with it, but he's just not getting it. Yeah. So starting in spring training, he was just spinning, spinning. And then the last two starts – he was tipping his pitches. Last start, he was trying to fix one tip and created another. Um, and it's it's just one of those things. He's got to figure out a way. Just slow down. There's plenty of guys that tip, get away with it when they when they have their stuff locked in. So, how's he tipping for it? What do you see? So the first against the Nationals, he was tapping different types of taps, hmm. and he was trying with every part of his being to fix it throughout that last start. And he was going fast. He was going slow. Well, he made a tempo problem his last start. So he was coming together slower and up to his uh, pause or whatever you want to say. And because yep. he does it the same way, whether he's out of the windup or stretch, the fastball was slower and the slider was fast. It was all tempo. And it was so easy to see the hitters had to know. And during the scouting reports, you know, there's times where you're like, hey, this is what he does on his changeup. He really digs in. And and you kind of understand, but if I, if I can't see it as a hitter, it doesn't matter. But both of those things are easy to see as a hitter. So I think they've got it hopefully ironed out. They're aware of it, and you know maybe they can move forward with it. Let me jump. Let me jump on that before we move on. So I've I've got some thoughts on tipping. I mean, do we want to tip? No. Uh, at the end of the day, if I execute uh, exactly. and throw and throw my pitch to the location that I need to throw it to, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> the only unanimous voted Hall of Fame guy in, in our sports history. Um, you knew it was coming. Every, everybody knew it was coming, whether he mm -hmm. tipped or not. Uh, how many times, you know, Fort, you can talk to this too. How many times during spring training do we have live VPs where the pitcher is telling you what pitch is coming and guys are fouling it off or they're swinging and missing or they're taking? Uh, if I execute the pitch, it doesn't matter. That's I couldn't agree line. more. We could That's not bottom agree more. line, and 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 with with Oviedo, I I kind of I took the Washington start and I threw it out the window, uh, just flat out. That's tough for a young pitcher, especially. That is tough. Two and a half hour rain delay or whatever the exact time was. Uh, saw him out there playing catch before they called the, the start of the delay. Was starting his warm up. I know he was sitting in the dugout for forty five minutes or close to an hour, and then went into the clubhouse. And it's kind of like when you saw that happen, you know it was going to be really a tough day. Um, went it's out always tougher on the road, isn't it? Because they, they, they don't give you as much information, on, I think, on purpose. You know, they kind of make you yeah, you a little. Yeah, you don't have as much information. You're also not as comfortable. You know, visiting right. clubhouses aren't set up for stuff like that, uh, whereas the home side has a sleeping room and it's bigger, it's more spacious. It's, you know, 
things like that. You can go into the family room and lay down on the couch, take a nap, whatever. Um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely tougher on the road, but for a young pitcher, I mean, it's for me, I'm taking OVA to start in DC. I'm crumbling it up, throwing it out the window and I'm saying, all right, look, let's, let's go out and compete. Maybe I see a little bit of tipping an, an example of that. I sat in the dugout in Washington actually with Ryan Zimmerman and Adam Dunn um, and watch Brian Wilson of the giants, watch them call every single pitch that he threw from yep. the dugout. Every single pitch he threw from the dugout, they called it. Cutter did it. Cutter, fastball. Both of them struck out, <laughs> you know, in that in that series. And it's we, like we, – We had it in Colorado, and we still couldn't hit him. No, no, so. Such a good point, yep. Playing with Adam Dunn had to be an experience, Cappy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was. I was actually yeah. living in D.C., and you and I have had this conversation and, and working for the Nationals at the time that Dunn was there. Um, and I just – I really enjoyed observing him from the press box. Yeah, he's, I, he's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Had to just be a, one of those unique teammates. Yeah, no doubt about it. He's awesome. Great teammate. Um, great competitor. But just uh, one of my favorites. That's all right, well, let's talk a little offense too. We won't we won't bore Pirates fans with Adam Dunn talk. Although I could go down that road. Um, how does this offense get back to form? And what you guys think? And and like, what are one or two keys? We talked about hitting runners in scoring position, but I mean, is there a bat that sort of links it all together? When I say that, I think about like maybe Key Brian Hayes. I I can see that getting hot and carrying them, or a Jack Sawinski type who was really really good got a little quiet during the streak. I don't know what happens there. Take it whatever way you guys want, but, you know, what What can the Pirates do offensively to be better? You want to go first, Cappy, or you want me to? Um, yeah, I can go first, and then I'll sit and listen. Um, I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts on it. I I think there's a couple of guys that have the capability of carrying a team. Key Bryan is one of them. I think Brian Reynolds is obviously the, the easy answer there. Um, Jack Sawinski is another guy. Um, I, the, the two guys that I've, I've been curious about all year, uh, is Bay and Marcano. Hmm. Um, and, and wh what I want to see more of is I want to see more of the small ball attempts, uh, because I think, I think it messes things up from the defensive side, from the pitching side. Uh, if I've got it in the back of my mind, this guy maybe fakes a bunt or he tries to lay down a bunt and he doesn't do it successfully, I've always got it in the back of my mind. Um, it's going to affect the pitches that they're going to see. And, and you know, both of those guys are kind of sneaky, uh, have some sneaky pop. So I think if, if they play around with just laying one down a little more, uh, especially Bay kind of on the drag bunt with that style kind of pulling it with him. Um, I think it's going to open up opportunities for them to get mistakes in the zone that, that maybe some damage can happen with. Uh, and then get on get on the base pass. We saw that a lot with Bay early. Uh, some of it may be a little bit reckless, but uh, it was disruptive. Uh, and and, and it, with the new rules, it made it fun. Um, so... Cappy, I'm glad you brought up Marcano. I was surprised. I, I just grabbed my notebook to, to write down his home run the other day, 413 at 105 mm -hmm. 5 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He walked past Tucapita Marcano 92 times in the clubhouse this season, and I didn't think he had 413 and 105 5 in him. I mean, he's yeah. not a big guy. He's not a power hitter, but that thing went a long way and it went a long way fast. And I agree yeah. with you. Sneaky he, did that, pop. he did that in LA too. He's got sneaky pop, and Bay's you know, got a lot of pop. But Fort, that's the extent of his major league home runs. It was his third home run. He'd back I, and, no, 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 I, I'm with you. I, I think I think consistency and understanding of where they fit helps out a lot. I mean, being a guy that had to play off the bench a lot, if if all that uncertainty doesn't go away at some point, you know, if Bay and Marcano are in the lineup, I, I really like Marcano. I'm bullish on him. I think he's mm -hmm. probably our best shortstop option day to day. Um and if we have a righty on the mound, I think he should be in the lineup because he makes good swing decisions. His 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 ability to extend it about is very very well. He obviously, will bunt. He'll move runners over. He'll do all the little things. But he's a sure hand at shortstop too. And then yeah. Bay, I think him trying to learn, you know, 
outfield, which I wish he would just stay out there a lot or play some second, a lot more second base, whatever they want to do with him, but they have to find a way to get him to be under control. You know, he's a guy that's a little bit all over the place and he's got to slow down. I think that'll help a lot of these guys because moving around is not easy. I did my last year and it's very, very tough because you have all the anxieties of trying to do everything right in the field. And then you come and hit, it's kind of like yeah. the last you know thing you're thinking of. But yeah, I think if we can have more of that balanced lineup and understand where a guy's at in a certain time and not force it. Like I want Jack Swinsky to play against every lefty that's down in the zone, like leave him in there. I think, I think, of Garrett Jones, they always used to pull him against lefties, and the guy absolutely annihilated lefties down the zone. He just didn't get enough at bats. So if you don't get at bats, that breaking ball is so tough. It's the same thing. Delay's going to have a hard time over time if he doesn't see. You know, the breaking ball is going to be a mess for him because they don't see it enough. Yeah. And you can go and hit off the eye machine all you want, which you know shapes the pitches. You have velocity and everything else. Didn't have that back in the day, Cappy, but they have that now, so they can do some things a little bit different. But that's the biggest thing for me is you can see these guys pressing – because they're in and out of the lineup, in and out of the lineup, in and out of the lineup, and there's no consistency there. They didn't have that back when you played for the Devil Rays? Yeah, the Tampa Day Devil Rays. <laughs> Come on. He said, he said, I was the Devil Rays. I was like, geez, am I like 52? What we, happened? We are, we are all. Yes, we're that old. <laughs> Ford, you're actually the baby, right? I, I guess I am, yeah. yeah. And at least in this group. Yeah, and we, have, we have Sir Cappy. In the top corner there. <laughs> Mister, that's right. Mr. that's right. There's the respect. Oh, no I, doubt about it. I agree it. with you guys on the uh, – I think you're saying a version of this, though. But I, I would like to see Bay, Castro, Marcano, somebody take hold of a job. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand why from a team perspective they're doing what they're doing and matching up and rotating guys. Add Chris Owings into the mix. You're trying to basically deploy players in the smartest way possible. But, I mean – if somebody gets hot, you're going to play that guy, right? Like, and I, and that guy is going to grow more comfortable. He's going to get more comfortable with the plate. But until he does that, you're going to keep bouncing people. So, like, I, I wish somebody would rise above that and sort of set roots down at a position. And I don't care, really care who it is or where it is, shortstop, second base. But I don't love all the mixing and matching there. I don't think it helps their team defense either. What, what do you think it would take to solidify the position for any of those guys? Three three thirty twenty five jacks ninety four <laughs> RBIs. Oh, that seems easy enough. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They better pick up a That's how whatever. It's... Hold in till O'Neill gets back. What August tenth, something like that. That would be nice. But all right. So I tweeted something out. Uh, we're going to move to another segment here with some questions for you guys. Um, some interesting ones here. As I'm checking Twitter, um, we can go through and hit a few of these. First one's from Aaron Smith. For Matt, what was your routine before and after an outing in terms of preparation and recovery? This is something I'm interested in hearing as well. We got well. There's uh, there's a couple of things that come into play here. So um, I always try to play catch and, and get out to some sort of long toss, 120 to 150 feet, kind of minimum for me. This is uh, after throwing. No, this is before this before is the game. Right. Yeah, 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 before like BP. Two, two thirty, three o'clock. You're saying? Yes. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, and then, you know, we had to we had to shag fly balls during BP. So we were out on the field during all, almost all of BP. Uh, my last couple of years, they started bringing us in that last group, uh, especially in the middle of the summer when it was hot, which was really nice. Um, <clears throat> and then I would uh, I would come in, I would eat, uh, would usually. Uh, sit in the dugout the first time through the lineup. So hopefully that's three three innings. I would sit in the dugout, and then I would go up and I would shower, uh, would put on my game uniform, and then uh, go out to the to the bullpen about the bottom of the fifth inning, uh, top of the sixth inning, something like that. And then uh, I would sit there and kind of talk with the guys, hang out, not take a whole lot serious until the seventh inning stretch. And then I literally got up and did a stretch uh, in the seventh inning stretch. I had a little routine I would go through. Uh, and then depending on the game situation, um, you know, if we were up by 10 or we were down by 10 and I had pitched the day before or within the last three or four days, I uh, mentally just kind of stayed mellow. Uh, if it was a close game, I started dialing in, started thinking about situations. Um, 
that I would come in and be used, who I would face, who they had on the bench, things like that. Um, I know you guys are going to laugh at me because you all have seen my body type, but after I pitched on day games, uh, I, almost all, <laughs> I, almost, I almost always went for a run um, through the city, whatever city we were in or around the ballpark, um, Pittsburgh, where, wherever we were. Um, I would run after day games if I pitched. Nice. Uh, night games, I would go in, and um, if we were at home or we were at a visiting ballpark that had a weight room, I would uh, get on the treadmill and do some stuff, and then I would I would get a little bit of a lift in. So, but it for me as a reliever, I, I didn't lift a, a lot. Um, I kind of prided myself on being available, trying to be available every night. Uh, so I just did enough to kind of flush the the soreness out for the next day. I have one more. Oh okay, yeah, go ahead, Mackie. Now, how long would you run, Captain? Like if it, uh, game, 20, 20, 25 minutes, so seven or eight miles. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding. <Right. laughs> That's outstanding. Oh, man. Uh, so I have a two-part question. One, did you ever do touch and feels? Yes. Like, yes. Explain so, that to the fans because that's something – I've watched a lot of baseball. It's dying. We don't see yeah. that as much because – I feel like everybody's full throttle all the time and they don't have that feel. Explain the yeah. touch and feel, what you used to do and why. Yeah, so after I would long toss, I would bring it in and I would get I would I would get it like 90 feet. So, you know, I would be at second base, my throwing partner on the line. Um, and you know, 65, 70% effort, something like that. I just try and feel my extension. Uh, you know, try to feel the ball coming off my fingertips. Uh, and making sure the ball was spinning right, you know, getting that extension and the rotation out of my hands. Um, I very rarely got on the mound until I was teammates with Brian Fuentes. Mm, and, uh, good, dude. T- good dude. Tito, we called him. Um, Tito, I noticed every day he would go into the bullpen and he would throw like six to ten pitches off the mound after he warmed, after he played long toss. And I asked him about it because I would do mine on flat ground and he made me feel like an idiot. <laughs> He's like, I mean, I get paid for what I do on the mound, so why would I not practice on the mound? I'm like, you know what? That's a great point. Uh, so I started doing some of that later in my career uh, where I would just bring the catcher up. They would have their heels on the front of home plate. So you're at, uh, what's that, 57, 56, 57 mm-hmm. uh, feet, something like that, and just – I, you, you're just trying to feel your body, feel your mechanics. And um, this is not why they call it a touch and feel, but just try to reach out and touch the catcher's mitt. And do you feel like that helped you along the way? Cause I believe in that big time. I, the Rays yeah, that, pretty much make guys do that and don't do flat grounds. So, so my, my kids, I, I think you guys know this. I've got 11 teams back home, uh, aged 11 to four, uh, 11 to 15 years old. And when we when they warm up, we stretch them, and then they warm up. They do their long toss. They all have to do ten um, with their throwing partner down on flat ground. Just ten touch and feels, fastball change ups. Uh, just get used to throwing the ball downhill. And then I I, I got to steal one more, Mackie, for both of you guys. Mackie, you're a runner. Caps, you used to be a runner. I don't know if you still run, but like now they train completely different. It's a sprint here, sprint there. Everything's about power, and injuries are way up. Cappy, did you ever arm, have an arm injury? Yeah, I tore my shoulder, but it was more of a uh, blunt force trauma. Okay. <laughs> but, like, don't – so, in I, Japan, they really believe in the conditioning, and then most of the guys, when they come over here, they get hurt, but over there, they're not as often. So, I want to ask you guys your thoughts on, is that going to make a play back? And – why did it ever leave in your all's opinion? I know the science behind it, but I think it's dumb. They didn't look at it full throttle, I don't think. I I can I can speak to this a little bit, guys, and not that, you know, I, I'm very careful to not put my athletic career on your level the same. But you as run that. a lot, Mackie. You run well, a lot. Well, I, I, I run and I pitched in college. It was mm-hmm. Division three, but it was higher than Little League. And, and, I mean, we still cared about arm injuries. They still mattered. Um, you know, we still condition, like, I know what you're talking about, touching fields and throwing bullpens and throwing 60% and, and whatever. And I, I did the same thing. And I don't know if that makes me a dinosaur or what, one thing I was always adamant about growing up, my dad preached to me, um, college pitching coach preached to us. We ran a lot. 
Um, we ran different ways. We ran, um, you would have, we, we would have a full running program, you know, the day after a start, I'm running for an hour. Um, and he would, you know, th- didn't have a real medically uh, advanced way of saying it, but he'd say, that flushes all the shit out of your arm. <laughs> I, that works. Yeah, that works. Is that a medical term? Or what? So anyway, we just took off and ran, you know, and then it, it was, I would always throw the day after a start. I, I thought it was, mm-hmm. important. I felt better throwing. I wouldn't go the whole hog, but I wanted to throw. Um, and then, you know, the second day after a start, I'd kill my legs and whether it's scissor claps, steps, sprints, um, suicides on a basketball court, we did all kinds of crap. And you know, I, I'm a big believer in that. And I, I think you get some of that now, um, but I I don't know. I, I would rather see guys not overthrowing, but actively throwing. And I don't mean throwing spin, snapping off curveballs, stupid Agreed. stuff like that. But, like, start, get out there, play a little catch, get some stuff moving, make sure you're running, that sort of thing. And I don't know. I think we've I, th- I think we've kind of lost that in the game. Whether I don't care what level you're at, if you're playing in Major League Baseball, if you're playing at Westminster College, like you know, it, that stuff still matters in my mind. It's just overall general conditioning. You know, if I can, if I can run thirty minutes, I'm I'm in decent shape. If I can run an hour, I'm in I'm in pretty good shape. Yeah. You know, and and when you run, it's not just your legs. You're moving your whole body and working your whole body. So, um, I also for me. Uh, a big part of like the the endurance running uh, and and I'm hesitant to say endurance running because you talked about running an hour I would run 20 25 minutes and and <laughs> be a, lot gassed. Of models, a lot of miles. I didn't always do it I said we were supposed to get yeah he's running a four minute mile though so that's a little different yeah yeah super fast yeah. very uh, very aerodynamic here <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, but it, the mental side of it, you know, when you're out running, it's just you and your thoughts. Yeah. Um, you know, and I very rarely now, now when I do run uh, and I work out, I have headphones in, but I very rarely have headphones in. Mm-hmm. It was just me and my thoughts, and I would think about the game. I would think about uh, who we were playing next. Like I was just in my head for twenty, thirty minutes, whatever it was, and. Uh, when I got back to the stadium or wherever my starting point was, my ending point, um, everything was done, you know, and then it's time to move on to the next. Yeah. That's awesome. Mac, I'm going to double down with your throwing. I think guys don't throw enough. Yep. There's a lot of, you know, Alan Yeager and Jerry Weinstein talk about taking your dog, taking your arm on a walk like a dog. It'll tell you when it's done. Yeah. Ready to come <laughs> home every time it works. It, it's such, such mm-hmm. an easy but brilliant way to look at it. All right, got another one here. I want to hear Ford's thoughts on this. I mean, this will be we'll, – we'll all get to it, but I, I think Ford should start this from Ethan Fisher. Speaking from the perspective of a former catcher and former pitcher, can Ford or Cap speak to the volume of a player like – or the value of a player like Austin Hedges, how his impact on the team and pitching staff goes beyond what can be found in the box court? Um, so here's the ball. Austin Hedges, what can he add? Um, I, I've never seen – such an enthusiastic guy to give, you know, everything he has, every given moment he has. Um, so I think he's an extension of the coaching staff. He brings a lot of experience from a lot of different places, first off, and he literally puts those guys first. And I, I think that was something I always took pride in. I think you have to as a catcher. Him and Delay do a great job. And then you add that with he's a great blocker. He's not throwing as well as he should, but a lot of that's not his fault. If you look at the, the times, the, all the little nuances that he does, and he's really good with umpires. That's something that's probably goes unnoticed, but he's really, really good with. He's got a good personality, and he's taking care of these young guys. He makes them think outside the box. He has a reason for everything he does. And yeah. I think, you know, if he hit a little bit more, a lot of people would love him. Um, but yeah, it's tough unless you know that he's a top four receiver, he's a top four or five blocker. I mean, he's doing everything well except swinging the baseball bat, but he's. He'll sacrifice. He'll he'll do the little things he needs to. And I think he's the ultimate teammate. So I think if you look at a guy and you say, hey, how can we make our team better? If you can put a bunch of guys like that and maximize their potential, I think you're doing really well. I don't know that I can. Your perspective is to a catcher like that. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can say it any better than that. Um, a catcher, when they're on defense, has to be absolutely selfless. Um, and... and you know, from the pitcher's perspective, uh, 
when we're on the same page and, and Austin seems to be on the same page with a lot of these guys, you know, Ford said he's an extension of the, of the coaching staff. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I don't know who's running the pitchers meetings and things like that, but for all I know, it could be him. Um, <clears throat> and when you have confidence in your catcher and the signals they're calling, uh, or I should say the buttons they're pushing nowadays, <laughs> Uh, it, it makes our job as a pitcher so much better. I mean, we uh, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, we cannot forget these are human beings out there. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're people. Uh, they second-guess their decisions. They second-guess their thoughts. Uh, so if I'm thinking one thing and then my catcher says something that is in alignment with that, I have more confidence uh, in what I'm about to try to do. Let me ask you guys this. Think about it the opposite way. You both have had bad guys behind the plate. There's no doubt in my mind. The effect of that, what is it? I, I think it's pretty easy to see, but like, you know, when when you when you have that, I'd like to hear y'all's perspective. Like, well, I, I I'll take this one because I think I'm gonna. I don't know how to say this nicely. The caliber of catcher I've thrown to has definitely been below the caliber of catcher that Matt Matt Caps has thrown <laughs> thrown to. And any of my friends that I grew up throwing to and are listening to this, I really do apologize. Um, but no, I mean it, it would mess with my head. Um, I don't know about you, Capper, but like you know, I, I would question like what pitch I'm throwing in a certain situation. Can I bounce this here? Um, you know, and, and more than that, if you have a guy like Hedges behind the plate, like I threw through to one guy in college that like I couldn't get a ball past him. I couldn't make a ball move enough to get past him. So if I'm 0-2 and I'm trying to put a guy away and I know that he might chase something, I don't care if I bounce him. Like I can't get it past him. And so that's kind of how I'd feel with Hedges. I, I always loved having a guy think along with me. Uh -huh. um, I, I didn't want to think. I could think. But if I knew a guy was thinking along with me and, and I know what he's calling is the right pitch, great. You know, it's like Forrest Gump. Well, one less thing. Um, that's kind of what the way I look at it. Um, and I, I have another point on hedges, but I don't want to. I don't want to take up Matt's space. What, what is? It, what was it like for you, though? No, I, I like that. I didn't want to think, but I could think. I didn't want to think, and I couldn't think. So, <laughs> you know, I, it's it, it. And you know, I'm, I'm joking when I say that, but yeah. I didn't, I did absolutely didn't want to think. And I got in trouble when I had to, um, you know, when, when we're on the same page, things move so smoothly and so easily and you have conviction with the pitches that you're throwing. And, you know, that's a, that's a great point. Having confidence to be able to bury something down, uh, especially with runners on base, you know, and, and most of the situations I pitched in, you know, one run games, the difference in having a runner at first base or second base could be the ball game. Uh, so having that confidence of, of getting ahead of a guy 0-2, 1-2, and then wanting to bury a slider down in the dirt, knowing that he was going to keep it in front of him and that runner wasn't going to advance, that's critical. And and I'm going to add one more thing to the, both you guys. Is I'm going to go back to Matt's point is you guys are human beings. So I'm going to throw to the game that, and call the game that you guys most represent with your personalities, period. And if you mm -hmm. want to throw something, I'm going to make you so convicted to throw it. I'm not going to tell you not to throw it. I'm going to say, if you're going to throw this, it's your pitch, right? Get it down here, do this, and just slap you on the ass as hard as I can and say, let's go. Because I want to give you the confidence because it's the conviction that you need, not that, you know, if it's right or wrong, doesn't matter. If you have no conviction in it, it's a waste, wasteful pitch. So, yeah, that's the yeah. biggest thing is understanding the guy's personality to take you even further so when things do go awry, because when it's going well, it's going well. But when it's going awry, that's when guys like Hedges really step up because they spent so much time with these guys outside the club, outside the clubhouse, outside the field, and understand who they are. They see the panic, they see the chaos, they also see the good, and they're able to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of balance that all the way through, so you guys can just go mindless. Yep, that's I'll the zone it. we want to be in. Amen. Yeah. I'll say one thing just to put a bow on the Hedges talk. Um, I think Pirates fans in general need to take a breath, and that includes Austin Hedges. Um, Amen. You know, the, the, there's been a lot of hammering on him, and I don't necessarily understand. I mean, I guess I understand why, because the batting average isn't good. But, you know, this team's still in first place. And we can sit here and talk objectively about them not playing very good baseball over the past 10, and that's completely fair. And there's things they've been doing wrong. There's things they need to improve. And to me, that's the, 
162 game grind that this thing is. But if you take any Pirates fan and, and say your team's going to be 21 and 17 through the first 38 games, would you take that? And I guarantee you they would. And there's this, you know, I think it's a mix between wanting to see Andy, wanting to see Henry Rod or Henry Rodriguez, Henry Davis, um, you know, and, and having a, a number one catcher that hasn't fared terribly well with the bat or hasn't fared well at all. And I just think we need to like step back and realize what was important during the hot streak. That's still important now. Um, and mm-hmm. that is Austin Hedges handling the starting pitching. And just because the starting pitching is bad doesn't mean Austin Hedges stinks at catcher. So anyway, um, that, that's my piece gleaned from my chat today where I had to talk a lot of people off the ledge um, and just let's, let's just realize where things are right now. Let's, let's let you finish that because I think Cappy would enjoy this conversation and whether, whether we add to it or not, I think your perspective is really, really good on this. Henry and Indy. Because like, yeah. I, I, I've been asked a thousand different times too, a thousand <laughs> different ways, and I want to hear your perspective and your thoughts on it and – at the end of the day, it's really what, you know, the front office believes and what they think and, you know, their plan on the long run because they had a five-year plan and they're trying to put it to work. So it's pretty it simple for me, Fort, and I'll, I'll let Caps finish after that. But, I mean, it's pretty – I want to see Henry Davis in AAA. That's non-negotiable for me. He's he's one one. He's probably the future of my organization. I want to see him in AAA. Um, Andy Rodriguez just got back from an elbow injury. I think he's played 20 games this season, was hitting before the game 260 – give or take. Um, I want to see him do more than that. I do think they need to pick a guy as a primary catcher and the other guy's probably going to bounce. At this point, it's best aligned, in my opinion, to get Henry Davis as that primary catcher and to bounce Andy. I would start experimenting with Andy at different positions. I would promote Henry Davis to AAA. If Andy Rodriguez catches fire over a month or so, I'd get him up here and figure it out. If you have to carry three, so be it. I'd want in that month Henry Davis to continue catching. If he catches very well and earns a promotion from there, maybe I think about it. I just don't think the time is right now, and I would be stunned if they did anything. I think people are kind of jumping the shark with wanting to get either of them up here right now. That's my piece. I, I learned something from that. I mean, you're you're more educated on that situation than I am, so <laughs> I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to. I'm not going to argue anything there. I mean, that's um, it, there's uh, one one. I mean, that's all you got to say. He was the first pick in the draft. That's a huge one, pick one. for an organization. That to was take. that was a brilliant way to say it. One one. Yeah. 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 Like you don't take chances with that, you know. And why do you jump him up from Double A? Right now, if you're saying, like, you need to catch. Anybody I've talked to about Henry is that he needs to catch. He needs to develop more as a catcher. Um, okay. To me, the, the important thing, and I think this is what you're saying, Capper, they need to get the development right on him. It's sort of like mm-hmm. the life I live in journalism. It's like, yeah, you want to be right, but you don't, and you want to be first, but you don't want to be first at the expense of being right. You know, like, I, I can't be wrong. Yes, I want to be other reporters with information that is good and and get myself out there, of course. But I never want to be wrong. I want to see Henry Davis get up to the big leagues. I want to see Andy Rodriguez get up to the big leagues and contribute. But I don't want to do that before they're ready because that's stupid. That's you know, and, and they might not be ready. Like they, there's more that both of them need to tell us about their readiness, and that could be the, the minutia of catching. That could be hitting more. That could be Andy's elbow. Frankly, it could be. Andy learning new positions, somebody learning new positions. Um, so anyway, I just – maybe that's something that's just kind of sticking out in my brain, but I, I would like to I'm, – I'm excited to see those guys. I just think it's not yet. Mm-hmm. I agree. What about you, Fort? Check. Um, I'm I'm, I mean, I'm, where would you put him? What do you got? I mean, where would you put him is the biggest thing. I mean, you would take a huge step back in, at the catching realm and just – because of 10 games, you can't say, oh, yeah, we need to bring those out because we need more of a bat. To right. what it, because what, of 10 games. And teams yeah, yeah it's just, we need, it, to, need to bring up the whole farm system. Yeah, yeah I, I'm with you with Indy. I, I don't know why there's, they've been so focused on keeping him behind the plate. I, I think of, you know, Joe Maurer. I mean, if he wants to catch, yeah. great. But the reality of it is I bring Joe Maurer up, Cappy, because I know you know him well. And, you know, you can preserve your body. You know, Buster Posey fell off. 
And if he's able, which I know he is, he, he graded out really well at a bunch of different positions, move him around. you got to keep him in the lineup. You're going to carry three with those two guys for a long time. And you got to have them in the lineup if they're going to be guys that could be possible middle order, order uh, guys that can impact a lineup in a heartbeat. So you look at it like that. If Henry Davis comes up, where is he playing? He's not going to DH, right? He's not going to play first because he's never played first. I'm just going to throw him in right and hope. I don't know. Is that yeah. good for the long run, or is it you know make everybody happy for the short term? Yeah. So. All right, gentlemen. This has been real. This has been fun. It's good is up. that it? We survived it? <laughs> we survived it. <laughs> and it's then time for you to go back to uh, – what do we got here? Sabatinos? Sabatinos? Uh, I got to look at the receipt again. Hold on. Sabatinos. Sabatinos. What do you got in the way of um, – I, I need a, a lunch spot, Capper, for Saturday. I think, I think it's Saturday. Here, yeah, night game. Here, here, here in Baltimore? Yeah, here in Baltimore. Mm, I don't know. I'll text you tomorrow about three. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you I, end up I, going tomorrow, huh? Yeah, I, I can get I want some seafood. I can give you a thumbs up or a thumb, thumbs down on wherever I end up tomorrow. I will say so. this. The last, last year's series, I remember walking out of the clubhouse and seeing there was like a whole spread with crabs and dudes are like mashing them with hammers. I'm like, this is painful, man. I got to go write a story and meet a deadline. And, and these guys yeah. Are, that's tough. Yeah. So get I'm after it. You know, get, get me some crap. There you go. All right. Well, I'll see if I can find one for you. All right. Well, I guess I'll take us out of here. Matt Caps, thank you for joining. For Michael McCaffrey. Thank you. Mac, you've been listening to Pitching In. We'll talk to you next week. Absolutely. Sir Cappy.